Last week, Dr. Bronowski described the three discoveries at the turn of the century that changed man's view of the world in which we live. The crucial ideas were J.J. Thomson's discovery of the electron, Max Planck's quantum theory, and Albert Einstein's theory of relativity. This week, Dr. Bronowski finds there's some trouble about light. Dr. Bronowski. I'd like today to talk to you about relativity. As always, I'd like to catch it in an image. The image that I have in my mind is a somewhat late one. In 1931 or 32, I can't now remember the exact year, I had recently graduated at Cambridge and I was a research student. And honorary degrees were awarded that year. One of them was awarded to Albert Einstein. So I first saw him in the flesh in that year getting an honorary degree. If you'll allow me a small aside before I speak about relativity, you and uh, our listeners will be amused to know that beside him there strode a noble-looking man, the poet William Butler Yeats, the greatest poet of the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, who also received an honorary degree on the same day. And on the other side, Gowland Hopkins, the founder of modern biochemistry, who also received an honorary degree. That's very characteristic of Cambridge in the time that I was an undergraduate there. That conjunction of the arts and the sciences as the most natural thing in the world. You see, we've now all come to think very much of the two cultures as a movement of protest against the division between science and the arts, that's recent. But what I learnt as a newcomer to Cambridge from 1927 to 1930 and a little after was that the two cultures come together when there are strong scientific minds who are also passionately interested in the new literature. There were two of my contemporaries at Cambridge whom I think of particularly. J.D. Bernal and J.B.S. Haldane, two very great men who would march about and come to Sunday night meetings of literary society and uh, buy from us copies of our literary magazines. I ran a literary magazine called Experiment. It was edited by me and William Empson, another mathematician who has since become famous as a literary critic, and Humphrey Jennings as a filmmaker. But it was all inspired by the sense that it was right to call a literary magazine by a scientific name such as Experiment. And what did people like Haldane and Bernal contribute to the new image of the scientists that emerged then? Well, one thing, of course, was that they were interested in biology. But as a foundation for that, they were interested in man as a human being. If Haldane told outrageous stories, if Bernal told intriguing stories, it was because they felt that the world was shifting under our feet. And of course it was. If I learnt anything from Cambridge, if I have anything to pass on to young people listening to me now, it is that science and literature are about life. They are not activities which one kind of human being or another kind carries on. If you think that science is carried on by scientists and poetry is carried on by poets, then you are as wrong as if you think that lovemaking is carried on by men and women do something else, or that lovemaking is carried on by women and men do something else. The fact is that the act of love, the activity of being profoundly, passionately human, is carried on by men and women together. And the activity of being profoundly, passionately intellectual is carried on by scientists and poets together. Why have I laid such stress on my undergraduate days? Why have I spoken so warmly 
about the relation at that particular time. I can put that very simply. Most people whose imagination is fired by literature in school fail to learn the vocabulary of science and therefore find it hard thereafter to follow anything but journalistic, gee whiz, second-rate accounts. By contrast, it's much easier for a scientist to give his attention to what Milton said or what Shakespeare said, even what a modern poet says, certainly what a modern filmmaker or dramatist says, and to understand it. But you see, that's at a superficial level, the level of language. Why do I think it's so important to say to people listening to us now, three great new ideas came into science at the beginning of the 20th century. And then to take the next of our conversation saying, and when I was a young man at Cambridge from 1927, such ideas were easily kicked around. I can tell you in a word. Because the new ideas are the new imagination. What happens in the world from one age to another is not a change in language or a change in personality, but a new imagination. I spoke of one of my colleagues, Humphrey Jennings, a filmmaker. He transformed the world for young people. He suddenly made the visual image tremendously strong. He and I together published, in experiment, the photographs of a young man called Henri Cartier-Bresson, who has since become a famous photographer, but was just a boy along of us at that time. What did he do? He suddenly made the camera a third eye which saw with a penetrating ability that we don't ordinarily see in ordinary vision. The great human gift is the gift of vision. We call it imagination. That means having images which we move inside our head and the juxtapositions of which become powerful. And what I'm trying to say in this conversation about my boyhood and my youth at Cambridge is by God, we had a marvelous privilege. We learnt that the imagination of the 20th century would arise from new things, from new pictures, from the new ideas in science. Why did C.P. Snow come out of that same Cambridge and uh, go on about there being two cultures that uh, don't seem to be able to reconcile themselves? And when C.P. Snow was at Cambridge at that time, with me, with Empson, with Humphrey Jennings. Uh, it was as natural to him as it was to us. It's only in his old age that he became somewhat dyspeptic and complaining about the lack of that. But uh, when we were undergraduates, when I was a young graduate student, nobody ever doubted that it was right for Yeats and Einstein to stride down the aisle of the Senate House together. Einstein gave a lecture the day after. We all went to the Senate House to hear him again. He had now taken off the great scarlet gown and the hat that he twisted in his hand so awkwardly during the ceremony, and he stood revealed under it like somebody out of a cartoon, wearing slippers but no socks, his shirt sticking out of the top of his sweater and out at the bottom. You couldn't even tell whether they had his shirt on back to front. Wonderful picture. And his lecture was wonderful to listen to because it was entirely full of speculations. It was so characteristic of what science is to scientists and is never to the amateur. Einstein talked about what he was trying to do, not about what he'd already done. You see, literature has a great advantage over science. You can see the poet thinking on the page. You can see the painter thinking in the picture. But in the scientific paper, the thought is always hidden and only the result, smooth and varnished and made up like a great lady coming down to dinner, presents itself. Mm -hmm. And the wonderful thing about Einstein was that he was never made up coming down to dinner. There he was in those old carpet slippers saying, what I'm trying to do is this and damn it, it won't come out. What was he trying to do? What wasn't coming out? 
let me take you back to Einstein's thought. When Einstein was a young man of 25, 26 in Bern in 1905, there was a trouble in physics. He was born in 1879. The trouble began in 1881 when he was only two. There was trouble about how light behaved. People were measuring the speed of light. In 1881, Michelson measured it. In 1887, it was measured more accurately by Michelson and Morley. And they found this unbelievable fact, which is that light travels equally fast. Whether the Earth, which is, as it were, projecting it out, is going in one direction or another. Well, that doesn't make any sense, because if light is a bullet, then it ought to be traveling faster if the rifle from which it's fired is going in the direction in which you're measuring it. And if light is not a bullet but a wave, well, then you ought to get differences in its speed if the Earth is traveling with the current in the waves or against the current. That you should get a frequency shift? That's in right. Case we were, yeah. That's right. But none of these things could be found. That's the most remarkable experiment in physics, you know, the Michelson and Morley experiment, because when you said to Michelson and Morley at the end of it, well, what figure have you found that you didn't expect? The answer was the figure naught. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing nobody could explain. They could have explained any positive or negative number, but nothing they couldn't explain. And there was this little patent clerk sitting in Bern, riding that tram from the clock tower to the patent office, and asking himself, why isn't it coming out? I paused, because somehow I feel like Einstein now. He had this gift that he just makes me feel, well, hell, what was going wrong? And Einstein said to him, there's, there's nothing going wrong. We're just not understanding what we are doing. Now, that was the great secret. What Einstein, in his tram, was saying, not, we don't understand what's going on. He said, we don't understand what we are doing. We don't understand that when we measure the velocity of light, we are doing something. We are setting a clock in motion. We're taking that clock to another place and timing another clock by it. We are bringing it back. We are now assuming that the clocks in the two places are keeping time correctly. We are making all kinds of assumptions about the physical world as if the physical world were entirely independent of what we're doing. And that isn't so. Physics is not something that God is carrying out in the outside world. It's what we little chaps are doing in our laboratory. That was the great secret which relativity revealed to him and through him to us. And to me it's still a miracle that he wrote one paper and he wrote it so simply and so convincingly that within months everybody understood what for 20, 25 years had been a mystery. He said, when we time the light, we are using clocks and comparing the time as told on one clock at this point and the time is told at another clock at the other point. And stupid that we are, we are not noticing that we can only compare these two clocks by looking from one to another with a very ray of light that we're sending along. We are building into the experiment the very observation that we claim to be making. Now, nowadays, we don't use light anymore. We send electromagnetic signals from place to place. We send out pips over the radio. But it always comes out the same. Because the fact is, there is no way in God's almighty world in which the man or the girl listening to me now 
and I sitting here several thousand miles away can communicate without sending the signal on this very beam with which we are trying to tell how far we are apart in time and space. Are we to say that 20th century man came to see that there are no absolutes? There are no absolute measurements, no absolute statements. Because the search for the absolute goes on, especially in the political field. And, and how right you are to draw attention to that. Because Einstein could say all this and could create this wonderful world of scientists who understood that you can only communicate with one another. You can't tell one another anything absolute. While meanwhile, behind him, the great machinery of dogma was thumping down in Hitler's Germany and in Stalin's Russia. And at the very moment when the new ideas were bursting out of the ground like spring blossom in German science, the men who were making these ideas were fleeing into exile. When I saw Einstein getting his honorary degree in Cambridge in 1931 or 1932, he already knew that Going back to Germany was just certain death. You know, think of what a divided world was coming about just then. It's the tragedy of the 20th century that when scientific ideas became most subtle, most rich, most personal, most individual, political ideas became most dogmatic and most bestial. You see, I come back to Einstein in the Senate House and his carpet slippers writing up these equations. You know, the great man, Nobel Prize already won 10 years ago. Great thoughts made 20, even 30 years before. And there he stands and he says to us kids, that's what I'm trying to do and it won't come out. And at that moment, Hitler and the Reichstag saying, and the German Reich will last for a thousand years. You know, what's the good of Einstein sitting there and saying you can't measure a thousand years without <laughs> taking a clock from one place to another when politicians are shrieking this kind of thing? If the 20th century did anything, it pointed up the terrible division between real thinking, human thinking, the imagination of scientists like Einstein, and the unimaginative, dogmatic, draconian way in which people like Hitler and Stalin were what they called thinking, what to me is just plain shouting and shouting loud enough so as to silence the voice of reason even in yourself. At the beginning of the scientific revolution in the English language, Francis Bacon wrote, if a man begin with certainties, he shall end in doubts. But if he begin with doubts, he shall end in certainties. What a wonderful quotation, George. I did, never knew that. Uh, Francis Bacon, of course, is a hero of mine, as he is of every modern scientist, and I will treasure it. I would only add, only if you begin with doubts, shall he end in knowledge. What we have to understand is that science never brings you certainty, not because it's science, but because it's human. It is not given to human beings to be certain about anything. We have very coarse, very simple brains. The miracle is that we understand anything about nature, even the little that we do. The miracle is that these wonderful complexities arise out of the simplicity. You know, back to my old boy in his carpet slippers, now sitting in the tram. The miracle is that that mind is able to encompass so much of the universe by asking a simple question, what Francis Bacon in your quotation calls a doubt, by saying to himself, not what is the universe like, but how do I do the measurement? What am I really doing when I think I'm comparing the time in two places? That was the late Jacob Bronowski in the second of ten conversations with George Steedman.